program committee's selection of today's speaker, Joel Kotkin, serves to remind us about the globalization of the world and our need to become more conversant with many cultures. Whether it's city clubs offering diversity training, the University of Oregon educating students in multiculturalism, or the Sunday Oregonian carrying an article about the fault line between civilizations, we're increasingly aware of the diversity that characterizes our world and Portland. Joel Kotkin is a writer, professor, consultant, and even soon to be television commentator who will address us today. His new book, available for sale in the back of the room, is Tribes, How Race, Religion, and the Family Determine Success in the Global Economy, and it forms the basis for his address today. Please join me in welcoming Joel Kotkin. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the, uh, the City Club in U.S. West for inviting me and um, start off by, <clears throat> by making a promise as a Californian that I have no intention of moving to Oregon. Um, and maybe after you hear what I have to say, you'll be relieved. Um, you know, Los Angeles has gotten a very bad rap and California's gotten a bad rap in recent years, but in many ways, what we're going through is something that you will be going through and maybe are just beginning to go through uh, in a very, very dramatic way. And the realities that I'm gonna try to lay out for you today are really realities that are not something about um, a event that is taking place far away. It's something that you'll be finding in your own streets, your own schools, your own churches. Now, some may see Oregon as a bit of a white Valhalla, separate from the travails and challenges of the world. But the dirty little fact is, whether you live in California or here in Portland, you cannot escape the consequences of the changes that are now beginning to sweep, not just the US, but the world economy. First of all, we are going into an, e an era in which the traditional nation state has begun to fade, and that new factors, primarily transnational, and focused on Asia are playing an ever more important role in the transformation of our own society as well as the world economy. Now, this has been hastened by several developments. The first thing is the end of the Cold War. Now, a lot of people talk about the end of the Cold War in terms of the former Soviet Union, the opening up of Eastern Europe. But the most important thing about the end of the Cold War, in my opinion, has been the opening up of the world in a way that has never been opened up before. We've talked about the global economy for a long time, but the interesting thing is we really didn't have a global economy. We had two global economies. One was living essentially in the Anglo-American capitalist world, and another that was living within the socialist framework uh, pioneered by the Soviet Union. That world has now collapsed, and with that collapse, there is the opening in the third world and in China and in India of a whole new kind of world economy which will be critical in the future. We are just at the beginning of that era. Just remember, China and India alone are 40% of humanity and they are two of the oldest and greatest civilizations in the history of mankind. And I will go back to this theme over and over again because this is where the action is going to be. Now, the other major aspect of the end of the Cold War has been obviously the diminishing of the military sector. Now, this has affected California more perhaps than Oregon, but nevertheless, by the reduction over time of the warfare economy, we are going to see the diminishment of the power of the nation state. Remember, the Pentagon in many ways shaped the American economy over the last 50 years. That influence is going to drop. Now, this influence is dropping at the same time that the international influence is getting greater. Let me just share a few statistics with you. Since the 1960s, the share of the U.S. economy involved in international trade has gone from about 8% to 25%. During the 1980s, global trade grew at about twice the rate of global GDP. And we here in the United States are becoming more and more dependent on exports for our very prosperity. One-fifth of all the value added in U.S. production today is now exported. 
At the same time that you have this trade in products, the trade in capital has grown even more rapidly. In 1980, direct foreign investment was roughly $50 billion. By 1990, worldwide, it was $250 billion. At the same time, telecommunications and transportation have brought the world closer and closer together. The number of international passengers during the 1980s doubled, and international phone calls from the U.S. alone increased by 400 percent. At the same time, you have had what I think is the most important of all the movements, the movements of people, particularly from the developing countries, to the what used to be called or still is referred to as the first world, most particularly the United States, Canada, and Australia. During the 1980s, 10 million people emigrated to the United States, nearly 40 percent of them from Asia, only 10 percent from Europe. Coupled with the end of the Cold War, the internationalization of the economy, this wave of immigration will profoundly affect the nature of markets and society over the next decade. Now, California may be on the cutting edge of this change, but it is becoming a national phenomena. Nearly one-third of all the grammar school children in America today are African American, Hispanic, or Asian. Only one out of every four is even partially of British descent. So the changes that we face in California today, the nation will find on its doorstep tomorrow. This globalization process affecting demographics, trade, finance, culture, in many ways uh, uh, brings to light the growing importance of groups that I define as global tribes, who have throughout the history of world capitalism played a crucial role. Global tribes are basically defined by three elements. One, they have to be dispersed. Second of all, they have a sense of uniqueness and a culture of self-help and self-sufficiency. And lastly, they have a cosmopolitan spirit which leads them to try to use new technologies and information to their advantage. Now this resurgence in the importance of ethnic roots and religion is often misunderstood as either racist or something like the cult-like insanity that we saw in Waco a few months ago. Yet it is part of something else, and it is a worldwide movement towards a search for some form of meaning, some form of identity in a world which is increasingly um, difficult to understand and changing very rapidly. We see this most clearly, of course, in the Middle East and in the former communist world. What is so fascinating and what virtually no social scientist would have predicted in the end of the, Cold, of the Cold War, in the end of the communist era, what did we see? We saw the, the rise of churches, mosques, synagogues, and temples rising like flowers after the rain. And of course, on the negative side, we saw the outbirth um, of a kind of tribalism, particularly in Yugoslavia, which uh, had the negative connotations of tribalism and ethnic identity. But what we can see very clearly is that with the collapse of the socialist system, the first thing to come to the fore, positively and negatively, has been this sense of identity. You know, we hear about the negative parts, but I just, just share with you just for a moment um, the incredible in interest that I had when I was in the Soviet Union, um, uh, the former Soviet Union, and saw two very interesting things. I went out to Zagorsk, where there is a um, a major Russian Orthodox center, and saw the kids lining up the young people about to get married in the Roman, uh, in the um, Russian Orthodox Church, and how what a change this was. They were telling me the priest was telling me over what had happened even 10 years previously. At the same time, I met with a bunch of young people in a little apartment um, in Moscow, where there was now a Jewish cultural uh, institute, which I have tried to support myself. Um, and what you saw was people who for years were being, having their pictures taken and were being hounded for even trying to learn Hebrew, even to trying to understand their own past, now were being able to function in the clear light of day. So when we think about this end and we think about Yugoslavia and we think about the negative things, we should also remember that for millions of human beings, they are now able to confront their own uh, sense of spirituality and identity with a freedom that had been denied them. But this is also taking place here in North America. The revival of religious sentiment would never have been um, 
uh, predicted by social science as I learned it in the early 70s at the University of California at Berkeley. But in 1970, of course, only 14% of Americans saw religion's impact to be increasing. By 1981, that had risen to 38%. And today, about two-thirds of all the American population believe that religion does play a major role in the formation of values and is increasingly important for society. Now, some people will look at this as a negative, but again, I see it in many ways as a positive, but more to the point, it leads us to a basic truth, which is that religious and ethnic identity is here with us. It is going to be a major factor in shaping the world that's coming. So we can discuss forever whether it's good or bad, but it is with us, it is a fundamental reality. Now the beginning of this process of what I would call global tribes, of these transnational groups, began with my own tribe, the Jews. In the earliest periods of capitalism, they were the first ones to do this. Now, it wasn't because they were better looking or smarter, although that might be true. Um, but you know, you read in the Old Testament, they say, uh, be fruitful and multiply. Well, the Jews took this a little seriously, and they created a uh, situation in which there was a very large population. And the problem is that Yahweh, in his wisdom, gave us a land that he advertised as the land of milk and honey, but in reality was the land of sand and rocks. So that the problem became that we had all this population and the land could not support it. So even at the time of the birth of, of Christ, two-thirds of all the Jews in the world lived outside of Palestine. And when the persecutions began, the Jews were forced to disperse further and further and further. So by the time of the Middle Ages, the Jewish communities were scattered from Spain to China. Now what could they do? Well, they couldn't own land in most places. They couldn't, um, they couldn't be in the military, and they certainly couldn't be in the church. So what could they do? They could make a living, usually eke out a living, by using a, uh, the little bit of the global economy that was beginning to develop. They developed a culture of self-help and a culture of trade that was extremely important. One key element of that was always to help the weaker members of the society. Maimonides wrote, he who increases the number of his slaves increases sin and iniquity in the world, whereas the man who employs poor Jews increase merits and religious deeds. Now what that means is, it, I'm now in my role as a uh, sort of pop uh, ta Talmudic scholar here, um, to make the, the point that if you have a worthless son-in-law or cousin, you gotta hire them. That the, that, the, that, that, that the strong in the community always have an obligation to help the weak. And this is important in all the global tribes. Now, the other thing is that these people, as they were forced to develop skills, brought with them to this part of the world skills that were perfectly suited for, the, for North America. And in almost every single major city, particularly in the Western United States, Jewish merchants were there at the very beginning of the formation of virtually every single commercial core in the Western United States, including Portland, Seattle, Denver, uh, Phoenix, Tucson, Los Angeles, and of course, San Francisco. Uh, they also brought with them very important skills. And these skills, as we will see later from um, the example of Asians coming here today, have been critical in the development of industries here. The great example um, is raised by the sociologist Thomas Sowell, who's probably done some of the best writing on this. And Professor Sowell says that the conventional economists always like to say that the Jews were lucky to get to New York when the garment industry was about to begin. And he said, well, that's about the same as saying that Hank Aaron was lucky to come to the plate when a home run was about to be hit. <laughs> the, the movement of people with attitudes, with skills from somewhere else, put in a different place can play a critical role. And that's true in the past, and that's true in, in the present. After the Jews, the largest uh, dispersion in history was that of the British. Uh, the British also had these very strong um, attitudes, what we now refer to as Calvinism, and they were able to bring from Britain, another place that overpopulated, attitudes that helped create the United States as the center of the world economy. They also had something else, they had no shame. 
what they were willing to do, Britain was not an advanced country by the standards of France or China or India um, when the 17th and 18th century rolled around. But what the British were willing to do was they were willing to take technology from North Africa, from China, from India, and improve upon it. As Daniel Defoe wrote, the British invented nothing but improved everything. And what happened is when they came here, what the British did to the rest of the world, we did to the British. Today, that Anglo-American tribe is still the most important in the world and account for roughly 40% of the industrialized world's GDP. But we are going into a new era. And that new era is seeing the emergence of what I call new global tribes, particularly from Asia. The most important of these by far are the, to date, have been the Japanese. And the Japanese have brought with them many of the same essential attitudes that we mentioned with the other groups. Hard work, a belief in the dignity of work, in the importance of family. At the same time, the Japanese were able to marry their commitment to their national culture with a passion for the acquisition of information and technology. Now, critically, the emergence of the Japanese was not based on government planning or the luring of companies from other regions. It was based first and foremost on the cultivation of skills and technologies within the indigenous economic base particularly among small firms that account for about 80% of Japan's manufacturing value added. If you look at the lessons from Japan that we can use here in our economies, it is clearly that the development of indigenous industry, and particularly small and medium-sized industry, is critical. And so that when states begin to get into the game of smokestack chasing and chip chasing, as a way of building their economy, they're really going down a blind alley. And a, an alley which, as we see with the emergence of the third world, you can't win. You cannot outbid the developing world. You cannot outbid um, another state. You will always find your economy and your environment degraded. You must begin to move <coughs> aggressively to develop your indigenous base. Now, the Japanese today are, I believe, at the peak of their power. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. The main one being that when the Japanese dispersed, unlike the other uh, dispersions that I talked about, they, they did not disperse per in permanent settlements. So they have what I would call a diaspora by design. They're sort of like 700,000 corporate Jesuits going around the world. They're there for three to five years. And that is a great system if you want to take a process that was made in Japan and bring it here. You can do it. But what happens if there are cultural factors involved? What happens if it's a service? What happens if the technology is changing very rapidly? And I believe that is why there have been many serious problems with the Japanese in high-tech industries, in the financial markets. In LA, we always have a saying that when the Japanese are buying real estate, sell when they're selling, buy. Um, because they're at the bottom of the information food chain. Japanese investment is beginning to fade in a significant way. Lastly, there are the, the factors of demographics. The Japanese birth rates are going down very low, and young Japanese don't seem to want to work quite as hard as their parents, and increasingly don't want to do the dirty industrial tasks that made Japan such a great power. Last year, 50% of the Tokyo University graduates in computer science went to real estate, finance, and insurance. Now, if they only discovered law, then Japan wouldn't be a threat at all, but... Uh, <coughs> but I would give them credit for being smarter than that. <laughs> so what are we going to see in the future? What's the next wave? The next wave is the developing world. If the 80s were the decade of Japan, the 90s are the decade of the developing countries. First of all, demographics. The workforces in the developing countries are growing at two to three times the rate of the United States and Japan. Uh, the European demographics are going down negatively. So the new markets, the new workforce is going to be in the developing countries. At the same time, the world balance power in terms of intelligent labor is also shifting. In 1970, only 20% of the college graduates that year were from the developing countries. Today, it's about 60%. If you look at science and technology, India now educates three times as many scientists and, en and engineers annually as does Germany. China educates twice as many. Korea educates more than France, and so does Mexico. 
Now, within this context of this enormous movement of, of workforce, new markets, and new intelligence, is the emergence of the, the group that I think will be the critical group in the 1990s, and that's the Chinese. Chinese, I, I'm talking about two groups. One, the 55 million overseas Chinese and mainland China. The overseas Chinese are probably about the most entrepreneurial people in the world. The people in Hong Kong start businesses at about twice the rate of Americans. Uh, there's an old saying, um, I'd rather be the head of a chicken than the tail of an ox. And Chinese are extraordinary in the last 20 years in find, and founding and growing new businesses. Today, the overseas Chinese have more billionaires than Canada, France, and the United Kingdom put together. And almost all those billionaires have made their fortunes within the last 20 to 30 years. Another critical attitude um, and, and a critical element is education. Taiwan, for instance, has a higher rate of literacy than the United States and sends more students to college at a per capita basis than any country in Europe. And you can see this, of course, in a place like California. Um, in 50% of the engineering students at, um, at UCLA are Asian. Um, and my friends at UCLA say that UCLA is no longer the University of California at Los Angeles, but the University of Caucasians lost among Asians. <laughs> Finally, there's this old Calvinist virtue called thrift. There's an, also an old ca uh, Cantonese saying, frugality is the key to success. And the Chinese have about the highest savings rates in the world. Taiwan today has the largest foreign currency reserves of any country in the world. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, with a population less than California, have twice the foreign currency reserves of the United States, Germany, or Japan. In terms of liquidity, in the world today. Very important factor that that liquidity is increasingly with the Chinese. At the same time, the Chinese influence is expanding and expanding in the fastest growing parts of the world. Southeast Asia, most of the major economies there are owned between 50 and 65 percent by Chinese who are already living there. At the same time, overseas Chinese, mainly from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore, are now the largest net new investors in these countries. In Vietnam, the two largest investors are Taiwan and Singapore, and uh, Hong Kong, those three, but, but Hong Kong and, and, and Taiwan number one and two. But the most important thing of all, dwarfing everything I've talked about, is the emergence of China itself as a major world economic power. By the year 2000, according to the World Bank, China will become the third largest economy in the world ahead of Germany, and by the year 2020 could be the world's largest economy. Again, the linkage there with the overseas Chinese, just as, as in Southeast Asia. 80% of all the investment going into China is from overseas Chinese. And they have an interesting way of dealing with it. You know, they're supposed to be uh, technically at war with each other, uh, the Taiwanese and, and, and the, the, the uh, mainland Chinese. So I asked a friend in Taiwan, I said, well, how do you do this? And he said, well, along the coast in Guangdong province, they have a saying that Beijing issues the regulations and we interpret them. Um, and basically, there is a very pragmatic attitude towards politics, and this, I believe, will be the nexus that will dominate the next century, this nexus between overseas Chinese and China. Down the road, I think you're going to see other groups emerge, uh, particularly the overseas Indians, about 10 to 15 million strong, very, very entrepreneurial, very successful, well-educated, merging increasingly with that huge technical base in India. India is already the best place in, in the world to develop software for, on a cost basis. Um, and again, people say to me, well, how can you talk about India seriously? And I try to remind them that 20 years ago, we were talking about the Chinese as a bunch of lunatics in mal jackets waving little red books. So the change, I think, that's going to take place in India will also surprise people. Now, what does this mean for us? You've been probably wondering that, right? OK. First of all, we must change our Eurocentric pr perspective, not for reasons of political correctness, because I don't care about that, but for reasons of self-interest. In 1990, two-thirds of all U.S. foreign investment went to Europe. That is insane, given where the world is going. If we're looking for capital, we're going to look increasingly to the Chinese and to other Asians. We see this in California today, where Chinese and Korean investors are moving in in very strong uh, terms. In terms of trade and new markets, our fastest growing markets are in the developing countries. Uh, Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong are themselves now a larger market than any European country. 
our, our exports to Mexico are growing more rapidly than to any other major market. I think people in Portland would understand this. Um, four of your top five um, sources of imports are from Asia and all five of your top export destinations. So this linkage in terms of trade and investment will become more and more important. Finally, there is the impact of immigration. For if you look at what's happening in LA today, as the old Anglo economy, the old warfare economy is dying, you see a new economy rising in textiles, in, in garments, in technology from the new tribes that have come here, the new immigrants, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Latinos, the Russian Jews, the Israelis, the Iranians. In, in Silicon Valley, there are over 20,000 Indian and Chinese engineers. Overall, Asians in California are producing five times as many new businesses as the general population. Same things are happening in New York, Chicago, LA. As one New York economist said, there's nothing wrong with New York that a million Chinese couldn't cure. We see similar processes going on with the Latino um, immigration. Latinos are emerging not just as workers in the critical growing industries, but also as owners. Close to 30% of the machine shops in LA today are owned by Latinos. The Latinos are increasing the numbers of firms at three times the rate of their increase in the population. Now, what does this mean, finally, for Portland? Well, these new dynamics are not as evident to you as, it is, as they are to those of us who live in Los Angeles. Only 6% of your population is foreign born. It's compared to 36% for LA, 24% for the Bay Area and Orange County, and about 9% nationwide. But I believe that Oregon will begin to see, in the next five to 10 years, a huge movement of Latinos and Asians into this area. As your economy begins to create jobs that are in many ways entry-level jobs, you're not going to see the people like me, you know, the tired old Anglo-Californians showing up. You're going to see populations of people from the new industrializing countries who are looking for opportunities and want to start small businesses. Already, the Latino population of Oregon during the 1980s grew by 71 percent, which was twice the national average. So as you try to fit into these new realities, you're going to have to adopt some new attitudes. It is my contention that in any region serious about economic development, the key is to look at the new demographic and world realities, not to resist them, but to embrace them. Indeed, throughout history, the greatest cities and regions have been those, Alexandria, Venice, Amsterdam, London, New York, and I would hope Los Angeles, that have found the ways, the difficult ways, of accommodating diversity. As the great French historian Fernand Burdell once observed, commerce flourishes best where the spirit of tolerance convenes. For regions, then, the key issue lies in shifting their own consciousness from the old idea of enforcing a society's homogeneity towards an approach that tolerates the harmonious coexistence of different dynamic cultural groups. If this gap can be overcome, then I believe that we can begin to create the beginnings of a new kind of civilization that both respects cultural diversity and adheres to critical values. In this effort, the investment capital, the skills, and most importantly, the, the values of global tribes can be critical assets. So rather than fear the new diversity that characterizes both the world economy and our own communities, we should devise strategies that allow us to make diversity not the thing that drags us down into the flames of racial conflict, but the thing that can turn our regions into the kind of cosmopolis that will thrive in the era of global tribes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure that will prompt lots of questions. We'll start with Andrew Wheeler, and then uh, Celeste Lewis will ask the second question, after which we open to City Club members. Mr. Kotkin, uh, Joel, maybe you've told us why we should be glad when Chinese come to our shores by, by whatever means. Uh, according to Robert Reich and Lester Thoreau, the global economy will be controlled by nations acting together as with the European Economic Community and NAFTA and whatever arrangements uh, happen in the Eastern Hemisphere. The community with the largest population and the most knowledge and resource will dominate or call the shots. With that arrangement, how will dispersed ethnic tribes control the global economy? Um, I appreciate that question because Thoreau and Reich are two of the um, least prescient uh, economists in the world today. Um, 
And I, I and first of all, let's start with take a look at what these guys have been saying for the last 10 to 15 years. All right, A, Thoreau in particular says, Asia's growing, it's gonna be a Japanese-dominated region. He didn't talk to the Koreans, he didn't talk to the Chinese. Where is the action in Asia today? It's not in Japan. It's in, it's in China, um, it, it's, it's in, um, in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia. Who's investing in China? Who's, who's, a, who's uh, rising in the East Asian economies? The whole idea of the Cambridge School, um, it's amazing how people with degrees can be so dumb. Um, the, the, the whole idea is they, th they see the world as sort of this you know, big game of risk. You remember the game of risk? You know, we go and you buy these little things and you move them around. But, you know, economies aren't about that. Economies are about people, about their motivations, about their work ethic. If you take a look at what's happening in Asia, that's one part of it. The other thing is that to believe that people in Asia are going to band together in some sort of pan-Asian confederation ignores thousands of years of conflict between the various groups and the, and the intimacy between groups. I, I was just recently uh, the uh, keynote speaker at the, at the Chinese Scientists and Engineers Convention in LA, and there you had people from Singapore, LA, San Francisco, um, and uh, um, from Taiwan and from the mainland, and they had a sense of solidarity holding them together. They don't feel any solidarity with the Japanese in particular. I mean, they don't necessarily don't want to do business with them, but in many ways, they look more closely upon us as a country with Chinese, as a place that has been accommodating to Chinese than they do to the Japanese with whom they have a very unfortunate history. In Europe, I think what Reich and those other guys always forget is the importance of motivation. Um, I worked for German TV at one time, and um, I have to tell you, it was an amazing experience. They got six weeks of vacation, uh, plus four weeks of home leaves, 10 weeks off, if you were Bavarian, you got Catholic holidays that, that even my priest friends couldn't tell me what they were about. Um, <laughs> they have the highest rate of sick days and absenteeism in the, in the advanced industrial world. They have the lowest growth of productivity of any advanced industrial country, the lowest economic growth rates over the last 10 to 15 years of any advanced industrial country, and yet they still hold it up as a role model. Maybe that's why the Clinton administration is sort of going the wrong direction. But the fact of the matter is, that, that there's these models, and I think what it is is models that they looked at in the 1970s, and if, in the 1970s I could see where you could feel the, that way. The other thing is if you look at what's happening with the with European community, it has certainly not been the dynamo that had been predicted. And I think a lot of it is, A, you have huge differences within the European community, and also you have, you have aging demographics, you have a huge welfare state, and um, frankly you really don't have much of a work ethic, particularly in the North. Um, I, I always think about when I was g giving a speech in, in, um, uh, in the, um, Denmark, and I, this was really, and I, they have this Euro class service in, on SAS. They make this big deal, you know, we'll take your bag and we'll take it to the hotel. And, I, um, and so I went to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to Copenhagen and, and I said, okay, well, here's this fancy service. Well, let's see how it works. He said, oh, no, it doesn't work. It's after 7 o'clock at night. I said, well, yeah, this is an airport. And what it turned out is on Sundays and after seven, the service doesn't exist. So I got into this big argument with them. And they said, well, we're not like you Americans who only think about making money. Well, I can tell you in Hong Kong, they don't think about whether it's seven o'clock or whether it's Sunday. So those factors, and I think what happens is that these, the, I mean, I think they're very bright people, but I think they're very impractical. They haven't been out in the field. All you have to do is just go out into the world, go inside of companies and you'll see where the dynamism is. I think the, the academics in particular have this desire for this well-planned world that they can then advise and control. Um, and the fact of the matter is the world is completely out of control. And, <laughs> um, and that attitude and families and ties between peoples are more important. And I, I think that the one thing that has been clear is that just because you form a bigger unit doesn't mean it's more successful. After all, the, the best dysfunctional case of dysfunctional tribes I know are large American companies. Okay. It's Les Lewis, um, Human Services Committee. Hi. Um, 
I'm interested in, a, in one point that you've talked about, uh, immigration. And um, U.S. policy on immigration this, you know, recently has been that you have to be a political refugee and you cannot be an economic refugee. And, and I, we're seeing the, the, the circumstance in Haiti. Right. And um, I'm not really up on this, but I know that, that, the, that we're limiting immigration from people from Hong Kong be unless they can, unless they can put six American workers to work, is that correct? Yes. And um, what I mean, what's your feelings on that? Well, I don't, if you want to broaden uh, um, those, because uh, American immigration policy is a monument to the uh, uh, the lack of uh, perspective by our elected leaders. Um, the um, first of all, okay, we have a very in our immigration policy. First of all, we don't. Um, uh, seem to be aware of the fact that immigration can be a positive economically so that we for instance you know, constantly running into like young PhDs and engineering at local universities who are having an incredibly difficult time emigrating to the United States even though they have jobs and and companies have a clear need for them and on the other hand we're taking people who are very much um, going to be almost immediately uh, unable to support themselves now I think that the refugee laws here have been um, very much abused um, by certain groups. Um, I think that uh, we took the case of the Vietnamese where, you know, after all, we did uh, have some responsibility there, and I think we were right to take the refugees. Um, but I think that we have been a little too um, open to some kinds of immigration um, and a little bit not open enough to other kinds of immigration. Um, and I think we have to understand um, that because we want to have immigrants who have a better chance of contributing long term. Fundamentally, though, I think immigration is something that is extremely positive. I think what, what, what uh, my great fear is that the illegal immigration, which it may not be a, such a big issue here, but is an enormous issue in Southern California, uh, will poison the whole attitude towards immigration itself and lead to some clamping down of immigration, and that would be a terrible tragedy. Andrew Wheeler, uh, I'm Ted K, uh, City Club member. Andrew Wheeler mentioned NAFTA. Oh, yes. And um, I wondered just uh, some perspectives from you on NAFTA in terms of uh, economic blocks in this hemisphere, in terms of global competitiveness and how that, that matches with your global tribes sure. idea, especially the idea that uh, could the Americas be one tribe or are we definitely more than one tribe? Okay, well, that was a lot of questions. Um, okay, first of all, as far as NAFTA is concerned, um, I see NAFTA positively, as I would look at the European community as positively, if it leads to the breakdown of national borders, if it leads to what the, the Reichians want to see, which is this managed world economy where, you know, Harvard professors fight, Tokyo University professors fight, the Sorbonne in some great game of global risk. Um, I certainly don't want to see that, and I don't think that will happen because I don't think the world works that way. But in the sense of what NAFTA is, and very different than what was being attempted in Europe, NAFTA was really about the reduction of trade barriers. Um, and I think it's basically a very positive thing. Um, it, and I think what we are seeing is not so much global tribes, but the emergence of transnational cultures um, in the United States. One of the impacts on this whole world, on this internationalization, is that regions are going to become more and more tied to their, their um, affiliations with the parts of the world economy that they're tied to. For instance, this part of the world has a very different attitude towards the uh, opportunities in Asia than maybe Michigan does. And Miami may view the Caribbean in a much more intimate way than the Pacific Northwest does. And of course, in California, we look at both the uh, Latin situation and the uh, East Asia situation. What I do think is happening is their emergence of transnational tribes uh, one, the Cubans throughout the uh, Caribbean basin, and the Mexicans in both the southwestern United States and um, uh, northern Mexico. And what you're seeing is the creation of a true mixed culture. Um, and I think a lot of people are scared about it. But I see northern Mexico becoming, in a sense, more like the, the southwestern U.S., and the southwestern U.S. becoming more like Mexico. And this blending of these cultures, and again, the, the blurring of national lines. So global tribes is only one measurement, 
But if I was to say, where would you see new tribes and new kinds of identities? I see two things. One, these transnational identities. And I also see, uh, by the way, a, um, a growth of regional identities. I think the Pacific Northwest is a, probably a great example of sort of the, you know, what unites the perspective of Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, in many ways, is much more than what unites this part of the world with the rest of the United States. And again, as the nation state becomes less important, the region becomes more important. And um, I've been doing a lot of reading recently on the history of the Italian city-states. And I think we're moving in some ways into that kind of pattern. And of course, the Italian city-states were um, remarkable areas in terms of their ability to um, create culture and trade. Hopefully, we won't inherit their um, political uh, chaotic uh, traditions, but uh, we'll try to avoid that. Hi, I'm Paul Milius, uh, club member. Um, would you comment, please, on the rise of both fundamentalist Christianity and fundamentalist Islam um, as world movements? Uh, uh, if we look at the atrocities committed in the name of religion sure. in uh, ages gone by and in the present, uh, I don't see those as positive, but would you comment on that? Again, it, um, I agree, not everything is positive. You know, I didn't, you know, that's one thing people say, well, you're writing about a phenomenon that exists. Um, that I think is necessarily good. You know, it's like asking a, 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 uh, a doctor who's writing a book about, about being overweight, you know, he's not, he's not endorsing the idea of getting fat. I mean, it's, it, it's really, I'm trying to talk about a, a, a process which has both positive and negative aspects. Um, I do think that there is this rise of, of identity um, and need for identity. One of the things that an Indian um, scholar said to me is that in the collapse of communism while we were you know, sort of uh, patting ourselves on the back for the victory of liberal capitalism, we had not noticed that liberal capitalism itself was beginning to fail, and that people were in the parts of the world that had rejected cap communism in the first place, that they were not necessarily embracing a sort of liberal democratic world view. They were really moving, in some cases, towards, as you suggest, um, uh, fundamentalist Christianity or fu fundamentalist I Islam. Um, my sense on global tribes is that if the Islamic world wants to become, as it once was, a global tribe of an incredible importance, it will have to shed some of its fundamentalism. Um, an example of that in, the, in, in Christianity is, the, emer is the, uh, the emergence of Mormonism moving away from very, very strict and very, very inward-looking perspectives to becoming very, very outward-looking. Um, and so religions can change. You know, the, um, the Jews of, that Voltaire um, uh, wrote about in Paris in the 1770s were very, very backward people, very, very inward people. So people can change, and I think if they want to succeed as a people, they're going to need to change. Um, so I think the, the, the question is going to be, can you have um, a, uh, this delicate balance? I think what I find successful groups have, they have a balance between sort of this almost irrational identity with the group and, and a mythology, and yet enough openness so that they can do well in the world. And that's always this sort of very difficult balance that they, are, they seem to be constantly fighting against. And um, so I think that, that in the Islamic world, that's really a major struggle um, that's going on right now. Bruce Roberts, City Club member. Joel, uh, the emerging tribes that you're speaking of generally are collectivist kind of societies, when they, uh, when they seem to be uh, becoming a part of the United States, they run against a really very individualistic uh, culture here, which tends to kind of shred collectivist societies from, from roots. Your assumption seems to be that the collectivist societies will maintain their, 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 their allegiance to the society as a whole. How do you think that these two cultures will, will, will eventually uh, work out with each other in the United States? Uh, that's a terrific question. Um, I don't know. I, I think that, that, that these groups are going through that now. Um, uh, you know, there's an old saying that what the first generation wishes to forget, the third wants to know. Um, and what you do see, for instance, among um, Asians, uh, certainly among Jews, is a, a growth of wanting to go back to some extent to rediscover those roots. Um, for instance, uh, in Los Angeles right now, the number of kosher restaurants, the number of Jewish uh, day schools has gone from 
you know, increase at least by five to six fold. Um, so I think there is um, a sense that, that groups know that there's something fundamentally wrong with the purely materialistic culture that we have in this country and that they have to, they're looking for some way to counteract that. And what I'm hoping is that we can find some sort of balance where society in general will find enough spiritual values to keep it on, and, you know, because you know, I see the spiritual and the collectivist a little bit in relationship, because in a sense, the spiritual is what allows you to give up a little of yourself. Um, and I find a very, very significant interest on the part of people in this society in general to try to find a way to combine those two things, whether it's in community service or through the church, and I think that's one of the, the things um, I think that, for instance, works so well in Utah um, is that the, the Utah culture and the Mormon culture maintains a sense of not just the religious side, but the community involvement. As Wallace Stegner, the great historian, wrote that I, you know, if there's an earthquake, I want to be wherever the Mormons are um, because they're already prepared and they're already thinking about those things. And so I think that, you know, I, I tend to see life more as sort of two principles sort of jostling and how can you find something in between um, and I think that uh, that's where we're at now and I think that what you're finding is in the growth of maybe not necessarily just fundamentalist Christianity but in the interest in for instance in Christian schools and Christian principles among the the uh, general American you know the Gentile population as we would say um, that I think there is a very very positive step there um, because I think people are beginning to realize that purely in uh, um, a state-oriented materialist culture is not going to be successful. It, I do a lot of work in South Central Los Angeles, and um, the most effective groups who get almost no publicity are the fundamentalist Christian churches there, most particularly the Crenshaw Christian Center and some others, who are out there really doing things, not playing political games. And if you look at who is really doing the good work in the poor communities of LA, very heavily it's you know, fundamentalist Christians and some grassroots Catholic lay people. Bob Turner, I'm a City Club member. Um, you spoke about how the ethnic uh, differences can be uh, creative, but we've also seen a lot of the destructive sure. consequences of ethnic uh, differences. How do we take some actions to bring about a more creative and less violent and conflict-ridden future? Well, I think there are a couple of things. One um, is you can't go one way, which was in Yugoslavia, where they virtually banned even the discussion of ethnic issues. And I think, and the same thing is true in Russia. I remember talking to one Russian poet who said that the anger of the Russian nationalists was because the communists essentially destroyed their own culture. And then people when they finally were freed, they started to create a culture that never even existed. And a mythology, you know, you, you create a vacuum of ignorance and then the worst elements fill it. Um, so one of the things is, I think critically, is education. And it's a very interesting balance. Um, I think we're in a real danger in America because we have two things that I see happening with education. One, the traditional education, which completely ignored ethnic diversity and had a version of world history which was from a total European perspective. And now in the schools, something quite different, a sort of PC history in which everything that, that, that you know, white males have ever done is obviously terrible and that the history of the United States is nothing but one set of atrocities after another um, and sort of ignoring the fact that you know, human beings have been committing atrocities probably from the first day that somebody got their hands on a club. Um, and not, not the city club, um, but, uh, um, but I think that, that fundamentally, I think it's got to be in finding some sort of balance in where we, we, again, embrace the diversity of our history, but we also stay to some sort of fundamental values. And I think that's, again, that same pattern of finding something in between. Because I think that whereas the old education created racial stereotypes and hatred, the new education is also doing the same. It's making, for instance, lots of Anglos feel completely um, either self-hating or that they're being taken advantage of. Um, and secondarily, um, you have a lot of, um, you know, for instance, uh, if I've debated Afrocentric historians who basically have literally to my face 
justified the Holocaust on the basis of that the Jews were exploiting the Germans. Um, and a whole historiography, which, which demonizes Jews, whites, whatever, and, and that this is being taught as history and science. And that is as dangerous as anything else. So I think how we teach history, how we deal with history, and how we deal with the past is very, very, very important. Ray Polanyi, City Club member. Uh, many people are concerned about population, uh, the numbers, and, and, and then again, maybe the, the impact of each population in, in, in the ways of resource consumption and so on and so forth. Uh, given that the groups that you mentioned are, are the more numerous and, and the more prolific perhaps, but then again perhaps the ones that have less of, a, of an impact worldwide in, in the way of consumption and, and overconsumption, uh, what, what do you see, how, how, how do those things play together? Well, I think that the thing that we'll probably find is as India, China, and other developing countries begin to become more prosperous, their birth rates will, will tend to drop. And as they get more urbanized, that seems to have happened virtually everywhere. You know, during the um, 16th, 17th century, 18th century, it was Europe that was breeding like mad and overpopulating at a very, very rapid rate. So I think in the, in the situation that we're going into now, I think we will see um, the um, these countries begin to drop their population growth rates. But it is a very dangerous thing because in a country such as particularly India, um, the, even though it's move, there's a larger and larger middle class, the middle class are having smaller families, but the people out in the villages are still having larger families. Um, and um, the same thing's happening in Mexico. But birth rates, by the way, in places like Mexico are dropping. And, and we certainly find that, with, for instance, among Latino immigrants, once they get to the United States, that they realize very quickly that a big family is not a plus. Um, so hopefully there'll be some self-correcting there. But but the, you know obviously the population problem is an enormous one. Although for the United States um, we're you know relatively um, insulated as a country, although the global impacts are rather str rather strong, and of course our consumption is very high. I think it's one of the dangerous things that we're going to have to deal with as a country is learning how to consume a relative less proportion of the world's resources. Seeing no other standing questions, perhaps I could ask one of my own. Sure. And that is, it seemed that you mentioned nearly every ethnic or racial group that's present in the United States except for African Americans. And is there an African tribe? And if so, where does that sit in this, the tribes that you describe? I, and, um, in terms of, of African Americans, I think you have a very unique situation. And um, one of the reasons is that, A, um, African Americans, but, and by that I don't mean people who have recently emigrated from Africa, which is uh, quite a different group, um, is you had a unique situation. People didn't come by choice. And so there's that factor. The second factor that's very, very different is that um, they were utterly cut off from their culture and forcibly cut off from their culture and that the countries that when they were um, uh, um, were, were released from slavery the um, the countries that they came from were then under colonial control so there was not the same kind of relationship with the homeland now um, one of the things I've studied is the history of the Garveyite movement which was around the 1920s and I write about this in the book and what Garvey's great observation was that there, in order for the um, uh, African-American uh, community to rebuild itself, that there needed to be some sort of identity, not just with Africa, but also with, with people of African descent in the Caribbean and in England as well. And that some move of identity um, and almost reconstruction of history is going to be important. You know, reconstruction of history is very, very dangerous and difficult thing. But when you realize that, for instance, after 2,000, over 2,000 years, that Hebrew returned as a spoken language, it can be done. Um, and so I believe that, that that is one element. The other element, I think, is, and I think this is a struggle in the African American community today, is that there has been, for many reasons, uh, because of the need to deal with the state-sponsored legal 
discrimination that existed, particularly in the South. The emphasis has been on the legal political process. And what has been left out has been the other struggle which Booker T. Washington um, dealt with uh, extensively, which was the self-help development of skills and community from the inside. Um, Booker T. Washington wrote that uh, any group that um, develops skills that the world needs will not for long be ostracized. And I think that we're going into a period in which there's an intense debate in the African American community, not just about the need to have some sort of identity, um, historical identity, but how can you begin to move as a group upward um, in a way that is not so dependent on the political process. And we're going to see this very intensely in many cities in America as Latinos, Asians, and other groups become the majorities or the largest minorities. I mean, in Los Angeles today, Asians and Latinos outnumber African Americans together by probably close to four to one. And now the voting strength is still not there for these groups, but inevitably the African American community in LA is going to have to become more like an ethnic community than like this large and unique minority. And I already see the emergence of a lot of new thinking in the African American community towards self-help. And I mentioned the Crenshaw Christian Center because um, they've been doing a lot of work in this area. I see an enormous um, emphasis on economic development that I never saw before. Um, I'm going to be running a, um, for RLA, um, this uh, Rebuild LA, um, a seminar, an um, a, a economic summit for South Central, and I was asked by the community to be the host. And um, the focus is really going to be on economic development. So I think that's a really important change, and very much along the lines of the experiences of the global tribes. And I think that that's going to be really critical. You know, somebody writing the economic history of tribes 20 years or 30 years or 40 years from now may have a very different roster than the one that I wrote. Thank you very much, Joel Kotkin, and thank you, uh, U.S. West, for sponsoring him. Please, we are adjourned.